Welcome to interstitial lung disease. So we're going to talk a little bit briefly about interstitial lung disease. There are over 200 different types of interstitial lung disease. So this is a broad category. Uh, so when we break it down, we'll break it down into a couple areas here. It's going to be what is a known cause for ILDs and then things that, uh, and then things that are sort of unknown um, so pneumoconiosis is going to be a word that we're going to be talking about here. And so we're just going to briefly brush over. This is not a very juicy read in your uh, disease book. Uh, so please just take the main points from this, right? And I'll try to stress some of the main points as we go through. But there's so many, so much that remember just the main points in the ILD section. So let's get started. So interstitial lung disease, in my book, it's chapter 26. Uh, it used to be known by a couple of different names, interstitial lung disease, uh, diffusion interstitial lung disease, uh, fibrotic interstitial lung disease. Now notice that the fibrotic part is there, right? Remember what's happening to ILD, and we've talked about this in pulmonary uh, AMP, is like your lung tissue is pretty much scarring up and it's causing that fibrosis like you're you're creating more scar tissue fibrotic tissue right uh, pulmonary fibrosis these are all just alternate terms for ILD uh, this is just a, a broad umbrella term ILD is a broad umbrella term for inflammatory lung disorders right and that's what we're going to look at is just the inflammatory lung disorders like I said don't you don't need to memorize all 200 and some odd of these, it's just understanding the main concept of ILD category, right? What they can look like, what are some of the primary things that you'll see. They are subcategorized as acute in the stages of ILD. Acute stage, a subacute, also known as a chronic stage. So those are your two main categories of like, is it an acute phase or subacute phase, right? Uh, this is all about inflammation. Inflammation, inflammation. Uh, usually, uh, you're going to see with inflammation, you're going to see a bunch of cellular fluid and connective tissue start to form. Uh, so it becomes more elastic. In other words, the lungs are more likely to be collapsed because they're more elastic, snapping back into its original position. So their lung compliance is going to be decreased. Their elastance is going to be increased. Remember, this is an inverse relationship. So their lung compliance is going to be low. So if you're going to put one of these people on a ventilator that has an ILD, they're going to have very low compliance, which means it's going to be hard to deliver a breath. Their lungs are very stiff. They're very, they're scar, their respiratory zone has a lot of scar tissue or connective tissue that's built up. If, it's, if they have a condition that's left untreated, it can lead to irreversible pulmonary fibrosis. In other words, they can't do anything to make that tissue more elastic again, right? Or more, sorry, less elastic again uh, to let their lung compliance reverse itself. So this is something that will be a chronic issue with these patients. Like I said, wide range of treatments, causes, uh, and prognosis, depending on which ones you have. So like I said, I'll just try to hit the highlights, and that's what I want you to focus on, right? This can be very, a very frustrating subject, so just focus on the highlights. Trust me in this. Focus on the highlights. Don't get lost in every single one of these ILDs that are out there. Uh, there's going to be a lot of similar and anatomical alterations. That's why they can broad... Uh, broad um, do a broad stroke with this because because there's going to be a lot of similar alterations um, for the lungs and same thing they're going to have a uh, similar cardiac and pulmonary uh, manifestation in other words the hemodynamics are going to be pretty similar across the board uh, pulmonary effects are going to be similar across the board that's why they just like COPD is a broad stroke of obstructive lung uh, three obstructive lung disorders. Same thing here. ILD is sort of a broad stroke because there's a lot of similarities between these. That's why I say just get the the general idea of ILDs and if it's a known cause or an unknown cause, acute versus subacute, and you should be doing pretty well with this. So let's start off with the acute stage. So this is the anatomic alterations in the acute stage. The acute stage of 
ILD. So this is where the bronchi, the alveolar walls, and all the alveolar spaces are involved. So massive amount of inflammation. Inflammation that leads to fibrosis, scar tissue, right? Uh, this fibrosis can lead to granulomas, just like what we talked about in tuberculosis, honeycombing that you'll see on CT, x-raying, and even cavitations being formed, which we talked about a little bit with uh, tuberculosis as well. So in the acute stage, mass amount of inflammation that leads to all these things. So inflammation is a key word here. Edema, that's that cellular debris as a result of injury. Uh, white blood cells, right? that will uh, invade the lungs, a massive thickening and inflammation, and then an increase in secretions because the body's trying to flush out whatever is causing this issue. So this is going to be one of the key things that you'll see here in the acute stage as well. All right, here's the picture, the animation from your book. And so you're looking at uh, interstitial lung disease. Uh, and looking at a microscopic view and uh, of the alveolar capillary, and then B is looking at a basophil, right, and the fibrosis. Um, so you're going to see a lot of stuff going on here. You're seeing a lot of scar tissue, inflammation, and a lot of uh, cellular debris just going on in this alveolar capillary space. So all this injury, all this inflammation and stuff is eventually going to cause that fibrosis, that scar tissue to form and create that pulmonary fibrosis that we know so well. So you're creating all these connections um, and making secretions. There's something irritating that tissue and it's going to cause ultimately an issue with their ability to um, expand their lung tissue down the road. All right, chronic stage. So this is the chronic stage, right? So uh, it's been going on for a while. They'll still have that inflammatory response going on. They'll still have the white blood cells going on. Um, you're going to have fibroblasts, right, that form uh, in the interstitial space. So you're going to see a lot of thickening in the interstitial space, which means the lungs are more prone to collapse. Fibrosis, of course, granulomas and honeycombing being formed and cavitations being formed. So do you notice secretions being in here, right? No secretions, right? Um, so there's usually, this is, they're getting all the inflammation. They still have everything going on, but they don't have as much secretions going on. Uh, and one of the things that we'll use in this disorder is, uh, is um, DLCOs, sort of see how severe their diffusion is changing, right? Because this would cause a uh, decrease and their DLCO because we're having the tissue, the alveolar capillary membrane, that tissue is turning into a lot of scar tissue. It's very thick, dense tissue. So to get oxygen from inside the alveoli into the bloodstream, it's going to be very, very hard. And so usually the DLCO is going to quanta help us quantify how severe this thickening is or how much effect it has on their tissue. Now we'll also do their volumes and flow rates. Flow rates aren't going to be as big of a deal here, but their volumes will be, uh, and we can sort of trend their volumes as well as the DLCO. All right, the big picture of this whole thing is you have destruction of alveoli, you have destruction of the capillaries, so you have both of them being destroyed. So it's like emphysema, but remember emphysema is the obstructive. This would be restrictive, right? So we have destruction of alveoli and capillaries. We're going to see the AC membrane getting really thick. Uh, we're going to have a lot of issues there. We're going to create uh, inflammation and granulomas, honeycombing, cavities. We're going to create a lot of fibrosis, right? Uh, especially if you have something where they were had asbestosis, that exposure to asbestos um, would be a big, big thing that you would see here. They'll form uh, pleural plaques, especially in asbestosis. Uh, bronchospasm can easily go with ILD as well. Remember this inflammation, the lungs are irritated by something. Well, what's one of the irritation protection mechanisms of your lungs? Bronchospasming, right? Well, we're going to prevent that irritation whatever's causing the irritation from going further down the respiratory tract. 
So that's where the bronchospasm comes into place, right? It's a protection mechanism. So that's why you would see bronchospasm in this. Excessive secretions caused by inflammation of the airway. Like I said, usually this is in response to the acute phase. Uh, the subacute usually, or the chronic, usually not a lot of secretions, but we'll get into it. All right, risk factors. There's a big table uh, in your book, and hopefully you guys are going through the book too. So they're going to be grouped according to occupational, environmental, disease associations. In other words, it's associated with this disease or associated with that, right? Um, and we're looking at their specific pathologies in there. So when we're looking at this table, uh, like I said, we're looking at different uh, causes, like did they get exposed to, exposed to asbestos or um, beryllium or was it um, paints or bird droppings or uh, was it secondary to drugs like antibiotics or um, illicit drug use, things like that. Was it because of radiation therapy or did they have irritant gases that caused it, right? So when we're looking at these things, we have miscellaneous ILDs that show up, right? Things like good pasture syndrome, um, things like that, eosinophilic pneumonia. Good pasture syndrome is interesting because, and I don't want to get too far off on the subject here. It's interesting because you have a bunch of hemoglobin that actually goes from the capillaries and goes into the capillary space, uh, goes into the lungs. So you have a bunch of hemoglobin that goes into the lungs. So if you do a DLCO on a patient with good pasture syndrome, what do you think it would show? Would it show a low DLCO or would it show a false high or normal? Yeah, that's right. It would show a false high or normal because there's hemoglobin soaking up the, 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 the carbon monoxide in the alveoli. So that's one of the weird things about good pastures. Okay, got that on my lung. <laughs> um, things like uh, lamb. Um, there's also other stuff like Wagoners and stuff like that in there. Uh, idiopathic uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, we don't know, right? So boop and lip uh, are some of the ones that we look at there. Uh, bronchiogenic organizing, obliterons, pneumonia. All right, all those things are cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Uh, so a cop, uh, cryptogenic organized pneumonia is necrotizing. It's just destroying tissue. It's crazy. Uh, there's also connective tissue diseases that are associated with developing an ILD, like scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, um, you name it. So those are some of the things that can also cause it because they have this inflammation going on in their body or their body's attacking itself and that can easily cause it and then one of the things especially if you watch this show that used to be on tv called house uh every time every episode it seemed like they were talking about could this be sarcoidosis right and we'll talk a little bit about sarcoidosis in here as well uh, occupational exposure coal dust hence the picture at the front part of the powerpoint slides uh, asbestosis we talked about those things like those are known causes we have unknown causes uh, radiation uh, irritant gases so let's talk a little bit about some of these all right so Known causes or associations are known as a pneumoconiosis. I would pay attention to that phrase. Just saying. Could come in handy for a review document uh, coming up soon. Uh, so this is usually a known cause, right? It's a known association. It's a known association as a pneumoconiosis. So this could be a dust exposure, like a asbestosis, right, that we talked about here. That would be a pneumoconiosis. So if I might ask you, hey, which of the following are pneumoconiosis, right, asbestos, that would be one that I would hope you would pick, right? Uh, so asbestos can cause asbestosis. Um, this can affect just one lung or a lobe or a segment of a lobe. It just sort of depends on the level of their exposure. Lower lobes are most commonly affected. The lower lobes are most commonly affected. The lower lobes are the most commonly affected with asbestosis. Uh, you might see some pleural calcifications too um, with exposure history. That's that. Remember, that's that one that we looked at. Like, oh, there's pleural calcifications specific to asbestosis. So that might be something we'd see on CT scan. Uh, let's look at coal dust. Right, we went over uh, asbestosis. That's a pneumoconiosis. Coal dust. 
is a pneumoconiosis as well. It's a known association. These are people that inhale large amount, large amount of coal dust. Uh, this one was known as coal workers pneumoconiosis or CWP. So CWP, coal workers pneumoconiosis. Uh, also used to be known as coal miners lung or black lung as well. Uh, causes have been reported which coal miners' wives even developed, developed this disease because of the dust they were exposed to from just the clothes that their husbands had on. So pretty significant issue. All that bad stuff that they're inhaling is causing scar tissue. It's causing severe inflammation. It's causing the alveolar, um, alveolar hemorrhaging. It's causing all this bad thing to go on. And even that secondary exposure is pretty significant. So here you see a pretty picture from your book. This makes for a good uh, wall screen back, you know, a good uh, back uh, back screen for your phone or for your your computer uh, if you're a nerd like me. All right, so cold workers pneumoconiosis. This is what this is looking at under a microscope. Uh, so massive amount of inhaled uh, particles. These are the the black lung or coal workers pneumoconiosis that you're seeing here. And you can see all these areas uh, where you're just getting thick, dark uh, coal workers uh, tissues. You're getting that progressive fibrosis and you see how much thick tissue is being built here, right? Uh, when you're looking at this whole area, let me change to yellow. So you see all this like thick tissue just being formed here. It's pretty massive and it's going to be causing that big alveolar capillary uh, response as well as causing that tissue just to develop scarring and sort of cavitate and block it from affecting the rest of the tissue and stop that irritation. That's why you'll form granulomas and all these cavitations just to stop it from spreading. It's pretty bad stuff. All right, so there's two subcategories of coworkers pneumoconiosis. You have your simple and your complicated. <laughs> I like how those how they do those two categories. Simple coworkers pneumoconiosis. Uh, you have some nodules that are located throughout the lungs, um, and it'll cause what's called focal emphysema. So it's not very widespread. It's just sort of here and there. Complicated, uh, you have these nodules, but they're pretty significant. They're greater than one centimeter in diameter. Uh, and you'll see more of the upper lobes, so that means it's spread. Remember, we talked about a lot of these go into the lower parts, but these will be in the upper lobes. Uh, usually, they'll have a lot of black pigmentation of these things. Uh, the dust itself is not something that's going to cause chemical change in their lung tissue. It's usually because the silica is there, and so we'll talk about silicosis here. So silica can cause silicosis. Uh, there's also some other terms for it called quartz silicosis, but silicosis is, remember, that's what the big part that was in the coal workers right thing, is that silica. So you're inhaling these things, right, and the main component uh, is mostly in rocks of the earth, so that's why that's a big part there. Uh, and it's going to be big where it can ultimately cause what's called simple silicosis or complicated silicosis. You see a theme here. Right. And the big thing here is going to be uh, uh, the diameter of the nodules that it causes. If it's a smaller diameter nodule, it's going to be simple, right? And they're usually symptom free, right? It's very small. Uh, if it's complicated, they'll have the large masses, so greater than nine millimeters of fibrosis tissue, more in the upper lobes, right? Like what we talked about before. Um, and usually these will form uh, necrotic or cavitations, just like we've seen in uh, tuberculosis, where it forms its own uh, fence line to contain. Uh, whatever the irritant is or the bacteria in the case of tuberculosis, you're going to have sort of the same thing here, but it's sort of containing that silica. Beryllium, uh, another type of a pneumoconiosis, right? These are all pneumoconiosis is what we're talking about. Plastic, ceramics, uh, rocket fuels, which hopefully none of you are playing with, <laughs> x-ray tubes. Um, in its raw form, beryllium's not hazardous, but uh, uh, when it's processed, it may cause a tissue reaction when it's inhaled 
or implanted into the skin, so please don't play with this too much. Uh, if you have, if you inhale this, uh, if you inhale their fumes, uh, it might cause a allergic pneumonitis, right? It might cause that sort of that that allergic response where you have the inflammation, slow reactive substance, anaphylaxis, so on and so forth. Just like you have like seasonal allergies, you might have that allergic pneumonitis, right? You might have that allergic reaction in your lungs. Uh, usually that's why you might see rhinitis, right? Just like you have with allergies, pharyngitis, like with allergies, tracheobronchitis, like with severe allergies, right? So it looks a lot like allergies here. The more complex form, if this continues to go on, you continue to expose yourself to this, you might get what's called borreliosis, right? <laughs> Development of granulomas and tissue uh, that you would see developing in the respiratory tract. So that would be something you'd see on x-ray or a CT scan, or they could do a lung biopsy. And a lung biopsy, an open lung biopsy, is the most accurate way they can see this nowadays. So in organic causes, so we've been looking at organics uh, so far. So inorganic causes, aluminum is one of them. People that work with aluminum um, particles, uh, forming aluminum, things like that, uh, especially if they don't wear their masks. Um, barium, clay, iron, uh, talx, uh, different types of powders, right? Those are all things that could really end up causing inhalation injury that develop into a pneumoconiosis or a known association, right? So these are uh, inorganic causes that also can cause uh, uh, ILD as well. So there's organic and inorganic, and these are all pneumoconiosis. These are all in the category, right? You're creating a category of known versus unknown, right? And so the known is AKA pneumoconiosis, right? And you're like organic, inorganic, right? And then we have our unknowns that we'll go into in a little bit. So things like this, uh, can people that are exposed to these things can easily cause um, something where it's a known association or pneumoconiosis. So types of organic materials, uh, these are the ones that usually cause like a, uh, uh, that, like I said, allergic reaction in the lungs. Uh, cell mediated re immune response happens so uh, things like uh, inhalation of like grains, uh, bird droppings and feathers, that was a house episode, oh, dust, <laughs> um, animal pelts, uh, coffee beans, yay Starbucks, uh, fish meal, uh, mushroom compost, uh, barley, straw, uh, farmers, there is even a farmer version, I think that we've covered that one too. Uh, with hay and stuff like that. So these are organic materials that are associated, right? All these these things that produce a dust or a mist that they're breathing in is not good for your lung tissue and causes scarring, right? Organic materials. Oh yeah, this is where we talked about the farmer's lung. Uh, immune response to allergens uh, and they'll produce antibodies and inflammation, of course, right? Uh, after prolonged times with it, they'll develop a hypersensitivity pneumonitis, also known as allergic alveolitis. <laughs> Sounds like a Dr. Seuss book so far. Often renamed according to the exposure that caused this disorder, right? That's why we talked about silicosis or asbestosis. It's usually named after what caused the exposure or what the exposure was, right? Uh, so hypersensitivity by uh, moldy hay. Uh, was called farmer's lung, right? Because that was where it was most commonly seen in that group. Okay, busy slide, uh, but I just sort of want you to see all the different things, the exposure sources, uh, and what, and like I said, I don't expect you to memorize this list. I want you to sort of see this list and be like, oh, these are a lot of things that can cause a, a ILD, right? And there's why reason ILDs are so prominent out there, but so underdiagnosed. Usually people think uh, a person comes in with shortness of breath, you know, dyspnea upon exertion, everything's looking like emphysema, when in fact they might have a, a career where they inhale silica dust, or they might have a career like uh, farmers, right? They might think that this person has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, when in fact they might have ILD, right? Interstitial, uh, 
IPF or interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, right? So a lot of the times these patients will get misdiagnosed as having COPD as far as signs and symptoms and all that stuff goes until you do a pulmonary function test, until you do an open lung biopsy, until you do right something that absolutely rules out COPD. Uh, that's when they will actually catch it and change it. So a lot of times just off of signs and symptoms without any diagnostic testing, this is going to look like COPD to a lot of physicians and even to you guys too. But just look at this list. There's so many things that can cause a pneumoconiosis. Uh, other things that could easily cause uh, um, inflammation in a known association, I should say, with developing uh, ILD, uh, it, long term exposure to things like antibiotics, uh, anti inflammatory agents, uh, we're talking like prolonged ex exposure here. Uh, even cardiac drugs can easily do it too. Now, I'm not going to make you guys, like I said, memorize this list. I just want you to get the general concept that even the type of drugs that a patient could be on at home for a chronic condition. Uh, could factor in to causing interstitial lung disease, right? Big point. Uh, more drugs that can also do this, and this is one of the ones I've seen the most, is the chemotherapy agents. Uh, this is something that this, these people would come in, and the big test that we want to see on these patients was the DLCO. That's sort of how they titrated uh, how strong of a chemotherapy to give because it's attacking everything in the body, right? The chemotherapy, right? It's giving you a toxic drug. It's attacking everything. The more it attacks, the, the more fibrosis that develops. So you want to see how severe the DLCO is before starting chemotherapy as well as uh, during chemotherapy. So we do this a lot, for, especially for like GBM patients, things like that. So chemotherapy is one of your big things and the DLCO was the big PFT that they would want on those patients. Other things that could factor into pulmonary fibrosis, uh, illicit drugs <laughs> that are on this list as well. Um, and then there are other things too. And what is this one here under miscellaneous agents? Huh. Oxygen toxicity can cause oxygen free radicals. And oxygen free radicals in your blood system can do a lot of bad thing, right? Remember, you have your antioxidants that are out there. This is an oxidant, right? Uh, in excessive use, not a great thing, right? We're talking about high PO2s and high saturations for a long time. Um, so the, we're not talking about titrating to a normal level. We're talking about over correction or too much or high over ex or in excessive PO2s, right? So this is where you can actually cause reduction of um, you can cause reduction of mucosal escalator. You can cause a reduction of surfactant production. You can cause your oxygen-free radicals. You can cause your lungs to pretty much turn into scar tissue with too much oxygen for a prolonged period of time. We're not talking about temporary. We're talking prolonged here. Um, drugs that uh, uh, hydrochlorothiazides, uh, even radiation, can even cause uh, IPF or interstitial lung disease. Uh, when we're looking at all these things. Like I said, I don't want you to memorize this list. I want you to sort of get chemotherapy, drug abuse, uh, miscellaneous things like too much oxygen or radiation therapy. Things like these can all factor in to how this lung compliance of this patient works. Because remember, they're going to have low lung compliance. And it's going to factor into how easy it is to get oxygen into their bloodstream. It's going to factor in to how hard it is to ventilate these patients. It's going to factor in to them um, and their, per, their prognosis, ultimately. Uh, so we talked about chemotherapy agents, right? Uh, the largest group associated with ILD would be your um, chemotherapy group. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we follow them in the PFT lab as well, so we can sort of uh, watch their progression as far as their uh, DLCOs is one of the big things that we'll look at there. We'll also look at their volumes too. DLCOs is just sort of the primary stressor that they gave us in the PFT lab. Too much oxygen, oxygen toxicity, we also talked about this, uh, is also a known uh, thing to cause diffuse pulmonary injury and ultimately lead to fibrosis. Talk about free radicals, reducing uh, the mucosidesk that it also inhibits your 
type 2 pneumocytes that secrete surfactant. And surfactants uh, ultimately what lubricates and keeps your lungs from collapsing. And if you take all the oil out of your car's engine, do you think the, the metal parts rubbing against each other are going to make it last long? Or do you think they're going to scar up and develop bad things, right? So you're taking the oil out of the engine, so to speak, and you're going to cause scar tissue to form in your lungs, right? Pretty bad. So general rule, uh, you're going to look at risk for benefit uh, overall. Uh, so that's how they're going to determine uh, dosage if they're doing chemotherapy uh, when we're looking at their PFTs. Um, sometimes it can take, it depends on the patient and how strong of a case they have, what's going to happen there. Radiation, just to touch on radiation a little bit. Usually this is also one of the treatments for cancer could also cause ILD. So if you're working in a place like MD Anderson or some place that does a lot of, um, that takes care of a lot of patients that happen to have uh, cancer, that's something just to be aware of when you're taking care of these patients, especially if you have to put them on a ventilator or anything like that, is what's going on with their lung compliance? What's going on with their ability to get oxygen into their bloodstream? And why is it so difficult, right? And so that can help you make better clinical decisions as part of the care team at the bedside. Uh, chronic radiation can easily lead to fibrosis um, and even cause acute uh, pneumonitis, ultimately. So they don't know exactly what causes the radiation-induced lung disease, but it's just a known association. Uh, so the exact pathway is not identified, as far as I'm aware, unless they have since... Um, since this has been recorded, but uh, that's just, they just don't know exact pathway. Sort of like uh, a xanthine is an unknown uh, mode of action uh, for bronchodilation and for increasing the respiratory drive. Same thing here, it's sort of an unknown pathway, but we know it does have effects, right? Establishment of diagnosis is similar to drug-induced disease, right? The big thing is going to be getting their history, right? and getting an open lung biopsy. And you're gonna see open lung biopsy is what I'm going to stress as far as diagnosis of an ILD. Once again, an open lung biopsy is what I'm going to stress as far as diagnosis with an ILD. Once again, I'm gonna stress that an open lung biopsy is gonna be one of the best ways to diagnose an ILD. All right, what about irritant gases, right? And this is where I, I said this in the other presentation as well. Uh, if you can see it or you can smell it, uh, you should not be breathing it. Uh, that's just a good general rule of things. Uh, so if you can see it or smell it, uh, maybe that's when you, you use a mask at your job, things like that. So irritant gases can cause a chemical pneumonitis. So that's something we have to be aware of. And in severe cases, that pneumonitis can lead to an ILD, right? That's that chronic exposure to that, that irritant. So chlorine is going to be one of the first ones, right? I talked to you guys about that 18-year-old lifeguard that got exposed to it, right? Continuing to get exposed to it year after year after year, so on and so forth, could easily lead to an ILD, right? Ammonia, ozone, like they see in welding, uh, NO2, or sorry, N2, uh, N2O, nitrogen dioxide, yeah. Uh, especially when they're um, looking at things like that. Uh, production of anoline dyes, like, so you're going to see some gases can also easily cause this as well that are out there uh, where their lungs over a long period of time of exposure to things like chlorine ammonia or ozone can eventually cause their lungs to scar up. So hopefully you got those things. Those are things that they could inhale that causes uh, or associated with uh, causing ILD. Now these are systemic diseases or disorders that are associated with causing ILD as well. And the first one we'll talk about is scleroderma, right? Hardening and thickening of the skin caused by collagen formation. So they're going to have hardening and thickening of the skin. Well, it's not just the skin that gets hard and thick. They also have issues with other organs. Those organs include the alveoli, the type 1 pneumocyte, right? So that's going to form a lot of collagen. Collagen is going to make the lungs more elastic. In other words, snap back and collapse back and so that's what you're going to see there that scleroderma 
this affects blood vessels too and connective tissues. So you'll see it with the lungs, you'll see it with the internal organs. The esophagus is highly affected by this, the GI tract, right? Uh, usually you're gonna have a lot of tissue in the lung parenchyma. Remember, parenchyma is an alternate word for respiratory zone. I told you guys you'd need to know those alternate terms and they would come in handy in other books, <laughs> knowing all the alternate terms. Uh, so it, it will scar up the respiratory zone, which is what we're seeing here. Most common in uh, uh, genetic females between 30 and 50 years of age overall. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I'll touch on this a little bit. Uh, I had a patient uh, come into the hospital and the doctor... Um, they had to consult pulmonary and I took care of this patient in the emergency department and then I think it was the next day and I was just working on the floors that day and I was taking care of the same patient and the pulmonologist came in and they were undiagnosed they had rheumatoid arthritis but they were undiagnosed um, rheumatoid arthritis at that time and their first symptom was hemoptysis. So it was a little weird um, that the presentation didn't show up. But rheumatoid arthritis is one of those things that is a, it's an inflammatory joint disease uh, that could involve the lungs. Now, it's not a, a definite, but it could involve the lungs. So in this patient, the presentation was actually backwards. And that sort of stood out to the pulmonologist as well as to me. Because I'm like, that's not something that I had ever seen where you would present without the joint first, you would present pulmonary first and then have the joints, but nevertheless, uh, with this one, uh, usually you'll see pleural, you can see um, uh, pleurisy without pleural fusion, right? Uh, so they have, feel that pleuritic chest pain and there's no effusion, right? Uh, and this is the most common uh, complication associated, is that sort of chest pain associated with it. Uh, if they do have an effusion, it's usually just on one side. Most common the right side. Remember, there's less lymph tissue on the right side, so therefore less ability to reabsorb that fluid. That's why it would be more unilateral and more prone to the right side overall. What's going on with this if they have rheumatoid arthritis? Well, what's going on here is they have fibrosis of the alveoli wall itself, so that type 1 pneumocyte uh, and then they're going to have a lot of cells that just develop in inflammation cells that uh, develop. And then they're going to have some lymph nodules that develop as well. Uh, these are more common in male patients when you're seeing the rheumatoid arthritis, uh, especially when it's affecting the lungs. So I went more common in genetic females, now more common in genetic males. Just sort of balance that out for you. So pulmonary nodules generally appear as well. Um, uh, on masses and progress to cavitation in these individuals and this is where a CT scan, a high-risk CT scan can come in handy as well. Alright, sarcoidosis. This is a big one. You'll see this out there, uh, especially like I said, episodes of house. Almost everyone had sarcoidosis, right? That was one of the things they were rolling out. Uh, unknown origin for sarcoidosis. That's what makes it so interesting. Uh, and then they're going to have this like, necrotizing tissue or non-caseating granulomas. So the tissue is going to be necrotic. It's going to be eating. It's dying. It's, it's infested tissue, right? Um, common sites of sarcoidosis, the lungs, the eyes, the liver, the kidney, the spleen, sorry, mucous membranes, uh, saliva, uh, usually the lymph glands are involved. So there's a ton of things. And one of the, the diagnostic procedures that can be very helpful in sarcoidosis would be endobronchial ultrasound or an EBUS bronching uh, where we sample the lymph tissue. Uh, so not just for lung cancer, but that's something we could also look for sarcoidosis on as well. So you would be assisting with an EBUS, right? That's something that you as an RRT would be helping with as well. So just a little side note there, EBUS could be diagnostic in a sarcoidosis case. Uh, the lung is the most frequently affected organ. The lung is the most frequently affected organ. The lung is the most frequently affected organ. Let me draw the exclamation points. Um, I would remember that. Uh, with manifestations including ILD, enlargement of the lymph nodes, of course, 
and or combination of both. So in sarcoidosis, I would remember this, this would be a good test question, uh, the lung is the most frequently affected organ in sarcoidosis. Uh, hallmarks in include immunoglobulin, so they'll do some blood work as well to look at IgM, IgG, and IgA overall. This can be anywhere between 10 years old and 40 years old. Highest incidence in your young adults those 20 and 30 year olds. Uh, more common in genetic women than men, uh, especially among African Americans. I'm unsure of that correlation, so uh, if you know, let me know. So IPF, inter inter idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is uh, just varies in how severe it is, and in severe cases, it can cause honeycombing. So if we have someone with IPF, uh, which is uh, is something we're suspecting on a patient. We'll do a biopsy, but if we do a CT scan or an x-ray, you might see honey coming. That would be a sign of the severity. Um, the precise cause is unknown, so this is not a pneumoconiosis, right? We have an unknown cause. We don't know what's causing this patient's IPF, right? They didn't inhale silicate dust. They weren't working with asbestos, right? This is an unknown cause cause this so therefore this is not I will repeat that this is not a pneumoconiosis right it's idiopathic all right separated into two major areas disquamative and UIPs uh, disquamative uh, usually you'll have hyperplasia and disquamatization of the type 2 cells which produce surfactant, right? And that's a huge ordeal, right? That's you taking the oil out of your car's engine. That's you, the engine then breaking down and causing um, that metal rubbing against each other and breaking and shearing things, right? So that hyperplasia and disquamatization, right? We're destroying things that, that, that secrete surfactants pretty bad. Uh, UIP, inflammatory cells and fibrosis, uh, you you have a lot of distortion of the the respiratory zone structure. Eventually, you're going to see that honeycombing. Right? Remember, we talked about honeycombing being a sign of severity up here in that first bullet point. Uh, prognosis with a DIP is significantly better than UIP. So if you had to pick, do not pick UIP. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll never have to make that decision at all, and no no one ever gets to make that decision ultimately. So IPF is not great. There's no known cause. And it usually will have a breakdown of your type 2 cells, and it has two subcategories. One of them is just type 2 cells. The other one involves uh, severity where you're distorting the lung tissue overall. Uh, COPs are also used to be known as BOOPs. Uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Uh, this is also uh, where you have tissues that plug the small airway. So tissue is plugging, not mucus plugging, tissue plugging them, right? So that's why they call it bronchiolitis obliterans, or that's why it used to be called bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia, or BOOP. <laughs> uh, now they refer to it as cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, so COP. Um, so more commonly you'll hear the term COPs. Uh, you might, if you have a generationally advanced pulmonologist, you might hear them call it BOOPs. Same thing, just different preferences on what they call it. Uh, you're going to have the uh, cell infiltration around the respiratory zone, hence the term organizing pneumonia, so it's going to present as a severe pneumonia initially. It's idiopathic, so it's been associated with connective tissue disease or gas inhalation and infection, but it's idiopathic overall. Um, but it's, it is associated with an event usually. That's what this is saying. It's idiopathic, but it's associated usually with an event. Uh, the x-ray on a cop uh, is going to be uh, uh, infiltrates, right, uh, more than interstitial involvement. So it's going to be sort of that hazy ground glass type look. Uh, usually, as with everything else, the open lung biopsy is going to be the best data uh, that you can get for this, right? Uh, it's one of the ILDs with the 
both restrictive and obstructive pathologies that are present. So this one's going to be a combined PFT, right? You're going to see low flow rates and you're going to see low volumes, right? You're going to see both. Because you have these tissue plugs, that's what creates that obstructive part of a boop or a cough, whichever one you want to use. Um, so you're going to sort of see that both or combined condition here. So if a patient has the ground glass opacities on their x-ray and we do a pulmonary function test and it shows both low volumes and low flow rates, they might order an open lung biopsy for this patient to confirm all right, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. I don't want to get you guys lost in the weeds here. Like I said, I don't want you to sort of memorize all of these, right? Get the general ideas about them. This is one I put, I purposely at, made sure to put in here because a lot of people will get misdi will get diagnosed with asthma, right? If it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, right? Swims like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? So a lot of people. Uh, they'll have, um, they'll be diagnosed with asthma, not a lot of people, there'll be people that are diagnosed with asthma that instead of having asthma that might actually have pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. And there's case studies like this out there. And like I said, you can always verify me. You can always go look up this stuff separate from me, but you'll see that out there too. So alveolar proteinosis presents a lot like asthma. So it's unknown, right? So this is not a pneumoconiosis unknown uh, where the alveoli become filled with protein and lipids. Lots of proteins and lipids, right? And similar to surfactant produced uh, by type 2 pneumocytes, um, usually seen in more of your middle uh, 20 to 50 years of adulthood age, uh, more likely to be genetic males. Um, uh, usually, they're not going to sort of be able to distinguish it from pulmonary edema, which is why they have this sort of that dry cough, bronchospasm. It's going to look, they're going to be wheezing. It's going to look a lot like asthma, right? Diagnosis in this one is a transbronchial open lung biopsy or an open lung biopsy. So this one would be an EBUS or an open lung biopsy. Uh, um, usually, uh, we could also do a regular bronch with a BAL, a bronchial alveolar lavage, where we wedge the scope as deep in the rest, as deep in the area as we can go, and we fill it with a bunch of uh, normal saline, and then we suck it back out, and then we sample that fluid that we sucked back out into this Lucan's trap. So we sample all that fluid in the Lucan's trap, and if we see a lot of that lipoproteins in there, that could be a sign they have pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. But these patients, like I said, some of these patients that are diagnosed with asthma, like severe asthma, can actually have pulmonary alveolar proteinosis and just be mixed diagnosed with asthma. So not something that happens to every asthmatic patient. There's just something to be aware of. You'll see cases here and there where these people are asthmatic and then they go to do a bronch. And sure enough, they have pulmonary alveolar proteinosis from a BAL. All right, bedside presentation. All right, back on track. <laughs> I just went off a little bit there so you can sort of see a little bit of a sample of what's going on there. Definitely remember some of the highlights that I put in there. But like I said, don't memorize every one of those screens, right? If you do, great. If you don't, but I'm not pressuring you to do so. Uh, presentation. What did this patient look like if they were to show up? Well, they're going to be tachypnic, right? If you can't breathe deep, you're going to breathe fast, right? Pain and anxiety, especially if there's pleural pain. Uh, heart beating fast, especially because it's associated with cyanosis. Hypertension, that's that anxiety part two. Uh, pain and anxiety causes hypertension as well, right? Someone's in severe pain and anxious, their heart rate and their blood pressure are going to be super high, separate of the, the clinical signs, right, that are going on. Uh, digital clubbing can happen, especially if there's chronic sinusitis. Of course, edema, a dry, non productive cough, especially that dry cough, just that irritated, dry cough. Uh, from this, it's going to be increased, dull percussion, note, very flat noise. Very flat noise, <laughs> right? Hardly any reverberation at all. Breath sounds are going to be bronchial, very deep tone. You might hear atelectatic crackles going on, pleural friction rubs, especially in the asbestosis thing that we were talking about. 
And then finally whispered pectorally, remember the tissue's getting more dense, so that's what would increase from it is the make the percussion note dull, all that bad stuff. X-ray, so this is gonna vary depending on what you're looking at. Um, you might see what's, a, what's known as a retronodular pattern, and we'll get into what that looks like here. Uh, you might see regular shaped opacities, those are like granulomas, um, cavities, honeycombing, all these things might be what you're looking at there. And finally, it, depending on how severe it is, you might see a pleural fusion, especially on that right side. All right, so this is one I took from your book. This is a retro reticulo, sorry, reticulo nodular pattern uh, in a patient with scleroderma. So obviously it's affecting their lungs. And you can see how, how ground glass, it looks like patchy uh, nodular patterns that you're seeing sort of develop on this x-ray um, going on. And then you just see all these little holes all over the place. So you see it's just destroying the tissue. It's pretty bad. Uh, this is a patient with asbestosis, so they have that um, inhalation of asbest. So this would be a pneumoconiosis, and you notice it's affecting the apices or the bases. Which one? Right, the bases here, right? And so this is just sort of that patchy, infiltrated look that you would see with an asbestosis. All right, so here is another patient. Uh, this is one of the uh, where you're looking at the pleural plaques that can form. Which one goes along with pleural plaques? Do you guys remember? All right, I'll let you look that one up. Uh, so we did talk about one that was more associated with pleural plaques, uh, and that would be your asbestosis, <laughs> uh, thickening of the pleural margins. You sort of see uh, in the in the PA in the lateral. I'm oh, sorry, AP, that's an AP x-ray in a lateral view that's going on here. And so you can sort of see that that thick um, calcified line that's formed here. That's why it shows up oh, opaque, right? You sort of see that, that really dense opaque line. That's what you're looking at there. That's what you see, that pleural plaque. All right, here's another x-ray. This is the acute farmer's lung. So this would be a pneumoconiosis, right? Diffuse parenchymal ground glass, GGOs, right? Ground glass appearance. So it looks like someone broke a bunch of glass, threw it on the screen, and you're looking at an x-ray through that glass, right? So you're gonna see a lot of parenchymal. You're gonna see a lot of respiratory, a lot of interstitial um, consolidation going on, right? That's what's gonna make it look so opacified and so so broken, right? So it looks so hazy overall. Okay, so this is a CT scan and you're looking at the left main stem bronchus and the right main stem bronchus. Now, the cool thing about this, and just a little side note, you see how the left main stem bronchus is almost like an oval and the right main stem bronchus is almost like a, a circle in itself. Right, this is the angle of the right and left main stems. Right, remember the left main stem has that flat uh, angle, like that 40 to 60 degree, and the right one has that 25 degree, so it's more of a straight shot down the lungs. So that's what you're seeing there. Remember, it's a CT scan, so it's a mirrored image. Even though this is the spine down here, and the sternum would be at the 12 o'clock, the spine's at the 6 o'clock. It's a mirrored image, so you're looking at the left lung with this oblong, and the right lung with this straight down. So that could be a landmark you could use. Uh, for this as well, if you're looking at uh, CT scans on a regular basis. So does this not look like a honeycombing pattern, right? That whole left lung, or sorry, the whole right lung there looks like that honeycombing pattern going on. Uh, it's just cysts, right? They're very, very large. Uh, and then this is a UIP. Remember we talked about D um, these and use UIPs. UIPs more severe, more likely to cause that honeycombing pattern. Uh, the left lung, not as much of the honeycombing pattern going on, so it's more localized to that right lung on this patient. All right, here is another um, one. This one is a, a, a rheumatic disease patient that has bilateral pleural fusions. Now, you can see that the patient over here on their left lung, they have that flat diaphragm. And that's because there's that fluid in there, in that pleural space, 
that's pushing up on that lung tissue and causing it to be flat over here. So you sort of see that being flat over here. On their, the patient's right lung, you see it's a more severe. Remember, there's less lymph tissue on the right side, and therefore it's more severe. Um, so this is a patient um, that has fibrosis going on, because you can see some of that ground glass opacity start to appear. Um, and this patient um, it has what's called a meniscus sign, which is that sort of curvature of the... Fluid. So if I were to give you a cylinder, here let me draw this, uh, give you a column of water, right, if you were to look very closely, you're, you're going to see it has this sort of slope to it. It's not going to be a straight across, it's going to have this sort of uh, concave slope to it. So uh, that's that meniscus sign that you're seeing over here is that, and that's usually a sign of a pleural fusion that you're seeing there overall. So just something for your general knowledge there. All right, patients with uh, ILDs, uh, in general, on their pulmonary function testing, their DLCO is going to be decreased. Now, I did talk to you about good pastures. That's one of the weird things about good pastures is their DLCO realistically, right? Do they have an issue where they're forming a ton of scar tissue and they're not able to get oxygen into their bloodstream? Absolutely. So realistically, their DLCO would be decreased, right? But because they're hemorrhaging hemoglobin into their alveoli, it's going to soak up that, that um, carbon monoxide, and it's going to cause a false normal or a false high. Isn't that crazy? But in general, their DLCOs are going to be decreased. So if I ask you about it, DLCOs are going to be decreased for ILD, all right? Except for good pasture syndrome. Uh, and idiopathic uh, uh, hemiodosis, so the same thing, red blood cells will be hemorrhaged into the, into the alveoli, and that's what would cause those ones to sort of be your exception to the rule. It's like English, uh, fall at all the times except for these times, right? Same thing here. <laughs> Just in general, decreased DLCOs for uh, ILDs. Um, but other than that, you're going to see decreased volumes, and then their flow rates. What do you notice about their flow rates? normal or in a severe case decreased. So low volumes, flow rates will either be normal or decreased depending on their severity. Uh, ABGs with these patients, if they have very mild ILD, usually it's that respiratory alkalosis. Remember that baseline tachypnea because they're trying to compensate for baseline uh, hypoxemia. Uh, so that's what you're usually going to see is sort of a baseline mild respiratory alkalosis that goes on. In severe cases, of course, you're going to have a compensated respiratory acidosis, right? Because they'll have that chronic respiratory failure similar to COPD. That's supposed to be a D. Uh, COPD as well. So that's one of the things. Doctor says patient comes in short of breath, with exertion, short of breath at baseline. They do a, a PFT. Uh, they do a, a ABG and it shows a composite respiratory acidosis. They might think they have COPD. So an x-ray actually might help the doctor differentiate as well. Okay, so this in general is going to be a shunt-like process. Remember, we have uh, the alveoli, it's super thick and developing the scar tissue. So we have blood flow that's going right past it, not picking up oxygen, not re relieving CO2. So this is perfusion without ventilation, therefore, shunt process or shunt-like process. I should say it's not a true shunt, it's shunt-like. Uh, so DO2 is going to be decreased because your CCO2 is low. Therefore, your CaO2 will be low. Uh, your consumptions or your metabolic rate is going to be normal. And then, of course, your O2 ER is going to be increased because your DO2 was decreased. And then your SpO2 is going to be decreased because your CaO2 was decreased, right? Uh, and your DO2 is decreased. So, shunt like process, nothing with your metabolics. Hemodynamics, okay, so right-sided heart pressures, and then we'll do your right-sided heart pressures. So your CVP, right atrial pressure, mean pulmonary pressure. 
pulmonary vascular resistance, and right ventricular stroke work index. All of these are increased. So right-sided heart pressures are increased because of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction as well as a bunch of other bad stuff that's going on in their lungs. What about left-sided heart pressures? So wedge pressure, cardiac output, stroke volume, systemic vascular resistance, left ventricular stroke work index, cardiac index, uh, uh, stroke volume index. So your left-sided heart pressures are all going to be normal when you're looking at this. So a lot of right-sided heart pressures. So you can see people with pulmonary conditions have a higher propensity towards core pulmonal or right-sided heart failure because of what's going on. And that's one of the things that uh, oxygen therapy can also help these patients with their cardiac function as well and avoid core pulmonal. Pretty cool. Interventions, things that we could do with these patients. Uh, corticosteroids are one, is one of the options out there. Systemic corticosteroids it reduce inflammation. Inhaled corticosteroids can reduce inflammation too. Remember, inhaled corticosteroids can take up to four weeks before they become clinically effective on the patient. So we'll probably start with systemic uh, corticosteroids first. Oxygen therapy, of course, pulmonary vasodilator, relieve the pressure on the right side of the heart. Uh, it'll help the patient overall unless we have oxidative injury that's going on. Assisted ventilation, especially if they're working hard to breathe. Uh, because they're going to be working harder to breathe, just at baseline, if this person that has an ILD gets a pneumonia on top of their ILD, they're going to have a very severe reaction, more severe than if you and I had a pneumonia, right? So assisted ventilation can be very, very important in some of these people. Uh, and that's why an ABG will be very helpful to determine how severe they are. This patient shows up, you put your PEMA scrubs on, PEMA stethoscope, patient shows up to the ER, and they're working hard to breathe, they're sweating, they're tachypnic, tachycardic, uh, x-ray looks really opaque, you draw a blood gas on them and it shows a chronic respiratory acidosis or a acute respiratory acidosis, that means this patient's in respiratory fatigue and or respiratory failure and that might be an indication. Now, in some cases, they can do different types of therapies, and this is just an example that I put under here, that plasma phoresis, where they exchange the plasma, can be something they do to help these patients sort of uh, come through this and replace what might be going wrong. All right, so how do we diagnose ILD? So an x-ray is going to be one of the first, most non-invasive ways to do it uh, out there, especially compared to, like, biopsies or uh, bronchoscopy, right? So an x-ray is going to be very, very useful and helpful. And actually, x-rays a lot of times also are used to rule out other conditions like congestive heart failure, things like that. Uh, so that's something that might be done first of all. Uh, bronchoscopy is going to be very helpful. Even in sarcoidosis, when we're looking at EBUS, that's going to be very, very helpful because we can do BAL. Uh, we can look for all those lipids and stuff that could be in there. We can do a bunch of things with bronchoscopy. We can see what it directly is going on there. We could sample it, right? Remember, we could use a brush for cytology, and we could do histology with a with a forcep. Uh, we can do BAL samples to look for the lipids, things like that. We can look for fungus if we do a BAL and look for an asbestosis. Isn't that crazy? So there's a, a not asbestosis, right? Um, the fungal pneumonia. So when we're looking at these things, it's going to be very useful. An open lung biopsy is going to be the one that I sort of want you to, what's the best way to diagnose an ILD? What's the best way to diagnose an ILD? This is the one that I want you thinking of in your mind, right? Currently, this is the best way to diagnose an ILD. History and physical, they could make a diagnose. Hey, you work in a coal mine, <laughs> all this other stuff. Silicosis, right? Uh, so history and physical can be used, exposure history can be used, but the most definitive way to diagnose would be an open lung biopsy. So which of the following would be the best way to diagnose an open lung, uh, to diagnose an ILD? You should pick open lung biopsy. All right, review questions. These are for you. What are the common alterations that occur with ILD, right? Is this a degree, uh, obstructive, restrictive, uh, uh, does it cause inflammation? Does it cause bronchospasm? What, I mean, what, what goes on, right? What go, is it the conducting zone? Is it the respiratory zone? What's going on here? Bedside evaluation, they show up to the ER. Uh, if they're in the acute phase, what would you see? 
What would be their heart rate? What would be their respiratory rate? What would be their breath sounds? What would be their percussion note? You name it. What would you see? X-ray. X-ray looked perfectly normal. Radiolucent. Radiopaque. Anything abnormal at all? What about their blood gas? In the mild stage, what about their blood gas in an acute stage? What type? Is this a shunt? Dead space? What happens to their metabolic rate? What happens to their venous saturations? What happens to their DO2? What would their PFTs be? What would it mean if their PFTs showed both obstructive and restrictive? What would their DLCO be? Anything abnormal about their hemodynamics? What would their right-sided heart pressures be? What would their left-sided heart pressures be? How do you diagnose? What's the best way to diagnose an ILD? A patient has ILD. What are some therapeutic interventions that we can do for these patients? 